help me out on the web and do some live coding. And so, so this is a test for you guys. You have to find like, the problem. Uh, and stop me at any point if there are any questions. Uh, so we know that one big concern people had about Meteor is lack of NPM support. Um, and basically, this is the first time we were presenting in a public way the fact that we now support that on the branch. It's a branch called Engine that's almost ready to be used. I'm probably going to send an email about it very, very soon. Um, but it's already working well enough to be able to use NPM packages and wrap them and create basically Meteor APIs around it. So we're going to show a small example of using an AWS package to do some basic operation with AWS. And that could be extended to create a full AWS smart package. What's AWS? AWS is a bizarre alien technology that you know, um, Amazon Web Services. You know, so this, it can, this can be done for any service. Basically, every service in the world has an NPM package now. In many cases, you can just wrap their API using HTTP calls with the Meteor HTTP package. But for the more complicated ones or ones with different interfaces, you probably want to use the NPM package. So um, the first thing you want to do is find which NPM package you want to use. That was actually harder than I wanted it to be. But first, I went to the AWS website and I said AWS Node.js, and I found this thing. It says, "Oh, here's an API. There's an AWS SDK package." And I said, "Okay, cool. I'll use this. Maybe somebody here could figure out how to use it, but I still couldn't figure out how to use it. There's no documentation. The examples on different pages have different APIs. And so, after trying to do this for uh, some period of time, uh, I gave up and I just looked for some others. I found this Knox one, and it looked kind of good. It said it's updated seven days ago and, you know, $2,000 a day. And TJ is like a famous node person. So I thought it might be good. Maybe there are better ones. I just don't know. But we'll use this one. So this supplies APIs for all the... So AWS is Amazon Web Services. It has um, S3 is one of the services where you create buckets where you store files. EC2 is a service where you can create machine instances that you can then run code on and... Uh, uh, so we're not going to wrap all the APIs, we're just going to focus on S3, and I'm actually just going to do one example. Um, so there's this client.list API. S3 is basically just a file system. You can list files, you can copy stuff there, download. Um, and I prepared a bucket, so we use this command line tool. So there's a bucket called tall test foo, and it kind of has a little bit of stuff. There's a test directory here that I created, and there are two files inside. Okay, so we're going to use Meteor to go and um, list these files. That doesn't sound like much, but we're going to, by doing so, wrap a node package and then enable us to go and implement all the other um, features relatively easily. So how do we start? Well, so we found which package we want to use. We want to try to use this Knox package. Um, the first thing we do is create a package. So Meteor, in the current implementation, has this constraint where apps can't directly use NPM packages. And there are various reasons for that, but partly um, apps don't have a control file where you can define these preferences. Apps are very simple. There's just lots of packages, basically. Um, that might change in the future, but for now, the first step is creating a package that will be used to wrap up the NPM module. And there will be easier ways to create these packages because this is still in the branch. It's a little bit weird, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually go and change my checkout directory um, and go and create a new directory here in packages called AWS. And uh, I'm going to just create a package in here, and I'm going to run it for my local <coughs> checkout so they can still access this package. And so what's the first step of creating a package? Um, you copy a package.js from a different one. So I'm going to just use the email one. Um, so we're just going to change this, and this is going to evolve into an AWS package. So access the AWS API. So let me make this bigger. Is that big enough in the back? Too big? Okay. Um, so now there's this new npm.depends directive. This, is, this works on the engine branch. Um, this is not relevant for us. And it's, it's very, very simple. You just define which npm packages you want to use and which version. And you need to specify a version because we want to ensure that people running your package will always get the same NPM dependency. So we diverge from the NPM philosophy with regards to version pinning. NPM encourages people to have um, ranges of versions you depend on, and we actually force you to have specific versions. When you want to upgrade, you just change the number here, and it's very, very simple. So we're going to take Knox. There's this one step we have to find which version number you want to use. We could probably improve that user experience for the first time, but for now, I'll just go here and see, okay, version 050 is the right one. So I just go 050, and 
let's say there are no tests for this package, and <laughs> this is in rapid iteration. You don't start the test in rapid iteration. Um, and let's say right now there's no file yet. It's just a package, right? And so how do we use this package now? Uh, let's go and create a AWS Curve Meteor is just an alias on my machine to the checked out version of Meteor. Um, so let's create an app called AWS and let's add the AWS package. So, okay, I can add the package to it. Because I'm running my checked out version of Meteor, it searches inside my checked out package directory for this package. Uh, but this will also be improved. So there'll be a better way to create a package within your app that's not built yet, but maybe it will be built on Monday. Um, now, within aws.js, let's kill This is my app that I'm building. So there's nothing for me to do yet. I just wrapped this package. But if I were now to define a server file, you know, I can now define functions that can be accessed from my app. So let's add one file called aws. Um, So this is just starting out. We're going to do this iteratively. Um, so what we now see here is the entire contents of the AWS package. They're just a package.js that defines which NPM dependencies we have and references one file. It's a server file that gets loaded. If we go back to the app that we have and we run it now, we'll get the first thing it does says updating NPM dependencies. That goes and fetches the NPM modules from NPM locates them inside the package directory locally. This is all transparent. Meteor manages NPM dependency versions for you. If I were now to go in here and change this version to 0.4.0, which may or may not exist, it'll say updating to 0.4.0, and once it's done... You didn't have to rerun the command. I didn't have to run NPM install, or any, I didn't have to go into the node modules directory, anything like that. Um, and, and it just updates. And it does all that seamlessly. You can add dependencies, remove them, and always manage to stay correctly. And if it doesn't, that's a bug, and we should fix it. So, and we believe this is just the best, basically, this is the easiest user experience you could expect from NPM modules, rather than having to manage directories um, and understand some of the internals of NPM. Um, so let's go back to 0.0. That's the right one. Okay, let it update. Um, now, Let's look at the Knox API. So way at the top, it says the first thing you want to do is configure it with your secrets. So um, I don't want to write this in code. So long-term packages should have a way to be configured. For those of you who use our auth packages, you can specify a Facebook secret and Facebook API key. Right now, that's done through a wizard, and that data is stored in MongoDB. So you never have code to commit to Git where you say, this is my secret. And if there's a breach, then everybody knows you're you know, secret for, for Facebook or AWS. So I also just prepared in my local database, um, wait, it's a different app, I'm gonna have to copy that, but we're gonna use a simple, a relatively simple pattern where we define a collection Assume that there's always only one entry in this AWS keys collection. Let's just see what we get there. Okay, so there's nothing there right now because I didn't populate my database with my secrets. just the way you start configuring this Knox NPM module. And from now, from this point, we should be able to use this client variable to go and access any API against S3 with our keys. Um, and another kind of interesting thing about this model where we store the keys in Mongo is that if you deploy it to a different machine, you don't have those keys. So your package can be, right now, it's as if you can configure the package by going and changing the contents of Mongo. Or you can go and have a wizard where you specify that in UI like you do for accounts. But as I said, the future package will have a configuration process where you have a dashboard, you have fuel that you can configure it. So it's part of our hosting platform. Um, so now what do we want to do? Let's try to use, let's list. We earlier were looking at these files here. Um, there's two files. Let's try to list these files. 
Um, there's a there's a client.list operation here. So let's just use that. And let's right now just put this here inside the packet. Let's just do something before we try to actually make an API. So you go client.list, prefix. Um, let's say the prefix here is slash test. And there's a callback. Let's see if we get an error. Let's just see what we got. What um, I have Nox is not defined. Right, what is Nox? How do I get access to the package here? We have npm that require. Okay, so it got something. Yay. Um, why is contents empty? Maybe you have to actually give it the full like, bucket name here. Oh, nice. Okay, so it found these files. Now, so far we haven't actually created an API of any kind. We just ran one command from the node module, just something that works. Um, so let's say we want to say, we want to access this from the client. So maybe we want to find a method. Now let's go and say in our app, <coughs> if we're on client code, we go on call, list, and the prefix is going to be, as we said, test. So this is wrong here, it should be prefix, prefix. So what we have now is a meteor method called list that just goes and lists the contents of an S3 bucket with a certain prefix. And then we're just going to call on the client when the client loads. So, so, we load our app, this is the Hello World app, and then we see that it actually went and called that on the server. So we already gave access for the client to go and make the server call out to LS. But the client didn't get back any of the data. You can see that by, if we add a call back here, So we'll see that it got called, but there's no result and no error. Because we didn't do anything on the server to go in and send that data back as the return value for the method. Um, the full story here is that Node uses an asynchronous model where functions don't return values, rather they're pass additional functions that then get called with the, re with the result of your operation. Um, Meteor intentionally diverges from that. We think it's a better user experience to create a synchronous API. Luckily, it's not that hard to wrap node asynchronous APIs into synchronous APIs using futures. Um, futures are a concept that's at first a little, sounds a little weird and as if it's this deep thing, but it's actually relatively simple. A future can be set up to wait on some other code that then goes and notifies it on its value, and only when it gets its value does the code continue processing. So it takes some time to completely wrap one's head around it, but there's a helper called future.wrap where you can pass it a node asynchronous function that conforms to a callback with error common data, as most node calls do, and turn it into a regular synchronous function that either returns a value or throws an exception. Meteor manages piping all that down to the client. So if a method throws an exception, that exception gets sent down to the client, or at least an unexpected error gets into the client. And if it returns a value, that's returned to the method call. So what we can do here is we can say, um, first of all, I'm just going to 
this is a, there's a little bit of JavaScriptness here because this is a function on an object. I need to make sure I bind it correctly. So I mean, there's no simple story there. And then what I can do now is I can say return future dot wrap client dot sorry list. Um, what wrap does is it takes an asynchronous function and returns a synchronous version of that. So really the way to think about this is now we have a synchronous function here. Um, future.wrap doesn't actually return the value. It returns a future that can be then weighted on. And this is also is, the purpose of this is so that you can still write parallel code. You can still send multiple futures, multiple asynchronous calls that will all then converge on one, sorry, all of them notify different futures. I don't have a good way to explain this. I'm not going to do it right now. But we can afterwards talk and I can show more examples. Um, but futures are very easy to use and helpful once you understand. So, so these calls block? So this, this is going to block this fiber. So no tells a story where you shouldn't use synchronous calls because it blocks the entire VM. That's only true if your VM runs in one thread or one fiber as a uh, node typically does. But we use node fibers. So any other connection will still be able to process. And if you call this dot unblock within this method, then this process, then this connection will also continue processing the original methods. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go return, list sync, and dot wait is just the way that futures work. So this future dot wrap, when I call it, it returns a future. That in itself doesn't wait, but dot wait actually waits until it's done and returns the value. If I were to have received an error, this would have thrown an exception. So that, and we don't need any of this anymore. So this is the entire logic. This goes actually calls the node call asynchronously, managing the return value back. How do you pass in the prefix? Um, you here. So future.wrap creates a function that receives the same argument as <coughs> the asynchronous one would have, other than the last callback argument. And then it matches that for you. Yeah, I mean, I think you have an error in the result backwards. On the right side. That's right. Can you just say prefix one prefix, like in this thing? Is that what it is? Let's look there and do that. Yeah, right. Any other bugs? Is it Get a cute Okay, so I have the result here. The result has contents, and you can see um, these files that we have. Right, this actually goes to S3. Now, this is an actual package, right? You probably don't want a package to go and create a method called list so that everyone can go, and any app in the world using this has a method called list. So really, what you probably want to do is create an actual API here. So maybe we define one global object in AWS where everything is encapsulated in this one global object. You can think of other approaches. Um, and let's just define this function here and put this stuff inside. And this is probably part of our app, actually. So really, this should be here. And this would just go out and call into AWS.list. So that was just to refactor, and the app does the exact same thing. We still get the result here. So, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. I'm just saying, but now we actually have an API. AWS.list can actually be used in a real media app on the server. You can do whatever you want. And you can define a method or not choose to do so. That's part of your app. So you probably don't want to let any user be able to access AWS. Here you can do appropriately check which user is logged in or something like that to add whatever kind of security there you choose to have. So the packages are available just in the global? Uh, yes. Space? Um, we basically there's all sorts of different philosophies for how you encapsulate packages, but one that works very well on the client side is just to have one global object and just make sure that everything's encapsulated to that one object. Uh, and we do that within Meteor. We have the Meteor global object. We have um, packages of object inside packages. We have emails of global object for email packages. So yes, we think every package should probably define one global object and localize. So anything you put in the global scope in the package will be in the global scope in your app? That's right, if you don't put a var inside. If you don't put a var inside. Yeah. So package files are wrapped in a, in a closure automatically, at least right now server ones and client ones in the future. 
Um, so you can use var as much as you want at the top level. So for example, this sub client is not should not be accessible. Let's see if that's actually right. Because it's wrapped in a function. Right, so client is not defined. So you can't access things that are, right, because we automatically wrap a server package file in a closure in a function basically and call it. So any var inside is kept local. But if you define it global, it's exported. That's implicit. Yes? I say, like, this is definitely something that we're, you know, up for changing. Like, we're, at, we're, we're changing lots of things about the packaging system and coming up with a better way to do things that doesn't help global as much might be in the future. Yeah, definitely. There are many approaches where we can elaborate on this. Um, but we think this, the, the node people think that you need to have this require thing where you explicitly define exports. That's a very good approach. Client side frameworks have a different approach. jQuery just takes over dollar sign, but it supplies no content mode, which allows you to then not have dollar sign, but still use it. So both of these approaches work. It's simpler to define a global, um, but definitely in the future, these things will change. And the other thing I'd say is like ECMAScript modules is the other thing that's coming down the, down the pipe. So I think like, yeah, we'll probably have some way of explicitly deciding which symbols are being exported, but I think it's it's about like understanding how to make the practices that are common on the server with the practices that are common on the client with the practices that are working the way that it stands body right now to figure out the best way to talk about exporting and importing symbols. I, I would just worry about uh, different packages becoming popular and not really being very careful about um, about what what's what's being exported and having to deal with collisions or something. So. Um, I think that probably won't happen if they stick with one global object with functions on it. Maybe they choose the same name, but then they probably won't work together anyways, like two different, I guess you could have two, you're saying maybe there are two AWS modules and one use both? Right, or, or just, AWS. you know, I don't know, maybe it's, it sure. It just seems like uh, in other frameworks languages there's a way to like import as a different name or something. Or, Give 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 the developer some control about what's what's ending up in their in their you I mean, know in you the could scope. Do that yourself if you really want to. You can go here and say like, you know, I guess you can't do that with both fonts. I mean, we've, 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 we talk about this a lot. We 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 know that our current package like dev format is not going to be the package format of Meteor 1.0. Like that's pretty clear, right? Was that safe to say? Yeah. And like this is one of the several things about it that needs to change. And as it turns out, we can only work on like so many things at the exact same time. I think it's pretty awesome, so, you know, just yeah. asking questions. No, no, these no. are really good points. Everything you say <laughs> yes. is, is totally Okay, correct. I'm not, like, just yeah. criticizing. Yes. No, 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 like, it's totally correct. You fix this. That's great. Yes. Yeah. You, you fix this. Um, but this works for now. And I think that's kind of it. I mean, this is only one example of this, but at this point, we're set up to go and define basically whatever else we want, right? If we want to say, like, RM or something, it's probably basically the same thing. And um, so that's all the everything that you would have for S3. And one could imagine spending an hour or more now and having a complete AWS API um, on top of this Knox NPM module. So that was just a short example of how you can use NPM support that we have on the engine branch. You can try using it now. Not everything works there perfectly. We're still fleshing out details, but this is very much close to being announced. And um, we hope that by doing so, we'll enable people to go and wrap a lot of the common NPM packages to what we believe is simpler APIs that are synchronous, uh, and maybe even just better APIs, because some of the known ones are kind of complicated for various reasons. So um, there's a third-party package manager called Atmosphere. Um, sorry, the package manager is called Meteorite Atmosphere, the repository. People are building packages there. In the future, not so far future, we're going to encapsulate that into Meteor as well, bring it in. But right now, you guys are welcome and encouraged to um, take whatever NPM module you think is most helpful to use, wrap it with a synchronous API, put it on Atmosphere, and over time, some of those things will join Meteor Core, and that will be a process that will also be evaluated uh, going forward. Um, so are there any more questions? Okay, and if any guys, if you are building packages or trying to build them and having issues, then I'll be around, and feel free to just grab me and we can talk about any issues.